Hello, everyone. Uh, you are watching Empowering Women Summit 2020, uh, which is uh, hosted by ITPLE Turkey Women in Engineering Affinity Group. My name is Kardan Büyüktan Raktar, and I'm Vice Chair of the ITPLE Women in Engineering Turkey Affinity Group. Today, we are with Shirin Tekinay. Uh, thank you for coming here, uh, Professor Shirin. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, I first read your bi brief bio, then I give the word to you, and uh, we will listen to you. Uh, Professor Shirin Teknay joined American University of Sharjah as Dean of Engineering starting February 1, 2020. Professor Teknay has held posts of academic and administration as Dean of Engineering and Natural Sciences, Vice President for Research and Development, and rector during the last decade. Prior to her tenure in Istanbul the last decade, she lived in the United States where she served as program director at the US National Sci Science Foundation. She was tenured faculty at the D Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and director of New Jersey Center of, uh, for Wireless Telecommunications. In addition to her core area of research and teaching, wireless communication networks and related areas, she has been working in and teaching gender in science and technology. She is the elected 2018-2021 Chair of Global Engineering Dean's Council and the board member of European Society for Engineering Education. Before starting her academic career, she was researcher at Bell Laboratories. Dean Tekinay holds the PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from George Mason University, Virginia, a master's and bachelor's degree in electrical electronics engineering from Boaz University, Istanbul. Now I'm giving the word to you in order to listen to your gender identities of engineering uh, careers. Let me. Thank you so much, Kardan. Let me try to share my screen. And in the meantime, comment that when you get up there in age, uh, your brief bio is not so brief anymore. So thank you for putting up with that. All right, everyone. It's lovely to be with you tonight um, in American University of Sharjah. And I decided instead of giving you a technical talk, uh, this is Women in Engineering, Empowering Women Summit. Um, with my recent uh, responsibilities, uh, duties, roles, I thought I could share with you what we need to do with engineering education globally in order to gender neutralize our profession. So this is me. Th these are the previously held posts, but you know all about that. But uh, as I remarked, since my bio keeps taking longer and longer to um, present myself with a connect the dots and then color by numbers um, kind of uh, two-dimensional little uh, bio here. So I'm very fortunate that my profession has taken me to a lot of places on earth and there are still lots of other places I would like to go to. I um, didn't uh, touristically visit these places, but I got to work with colleagues, uh, make an impact, make a change at all these places. Um, and I think it's a privilege. Uh, I hope to go on for as long as I can. Um, now, women in engineering, let me just talk about role models. I'm an electrical engineer and um, a daughter of lawyers. I have a lot of law people in my family, um, but I've been extremely fortunate in my life because my father is a civil law professor and I've had excellent teachers that did not sacrifice any bit of meritocracy for who you were, whether you were a girl or a boy, or you came from this or that family. Uh, I've been encouraged towards my passions, my curiosities, and uh, the result is 
I've had this satisfying, privileged, blessed career. And my job is to pay it forward to those who are getting discriminated against, to those who are underrepresented. Now, we keep saying we need to increase the number of role models uh, so that maybe we'll have more women in engineering. Let's talk about role models a little bit, and then I'll go back to uh, more seriously the area of engineering education and diversity in engineering education. I'll start with an unorthodox way of talking about role models. This was a TV series aired in the 70s in Turkey. I was a little girl then. This takes place on a spaceship. This is the aggressive war captain, good with ladies. This is number two guy, the science officer of the spaceship. Purely logical, everyone respects him. This is the doctor, passionate. This, Lieutenant Ura, is probably number one in uh, all of the women of the uh, spaceship, but she answers the space phone with a very soft voice. So my role model was Mr. Spock, because children, whether they're girls or boys, really want to have an impact. They want to make a difference. They want to be respected. They want the prestige. Nobody cares if the role model is a boy or a girl. Adults say that. Don't say that to children. Tell them they can be anyone and anything they want. I wanted to be the space officer of the spaceship. Unfortunately, I have a bone to pick with these TV series. In the 90s, here is a very, very uh, popular TV series. Popular girl, aggressive, sexy, flirtatious boy, like Captain Kirk. Uh, here is, unfortunately, the scientist who's just not the coolest guy. He's nerdy and so on. So people want to associate more with the cool people, popular people. Too bad. Anyway, word about TV series. None of the characters of these sitcoms are real people. They're cartoon characters of one or two aspects of human psyche. Nobody's logical all the time. Nobody's flirtatious all the time. Nobody's emotional and passionate all the time. When you connect all of these people together, they make one real person. But because when we watch them, we see different components of ourselves interacting on the screen, we get hooked. And producers know this. This is why we keep watching these TV series. Here's one from the 20s. Flirtatious one, logical one, uh, romantic one. Oh, by the way, there's always a romantic one. Here is the romantic one over here and so on and so forth. Here is one from the 80s, same thing, logical one, flirtatious one, romantic one, uh, the one that pulls them together. In the 2010s, thank goodness, there was a TV series that uh, made science look cool and not nerdy or nerdy was cool and so on. So anyway, uh, so much about role models. We're all everything. Don't let anyone classify you or the children into being romantic, artsy, logical. We'll be an engineer, good with math. These are labels. So the choice of role model really comes from parents, family, teachers, peers, friends. We all know this, and unfortunately, a lot of prejudice, preconceived notions. Engineering is a man's job. Uh, and of course, geography and culture. There are chefs from a certain uh, area that are all male, and uh, in other areas, cooking is the woman's job, and so on. Professional identities get dominated by one or the other gender, unfortunately. Loss for that profession loss of 
all the innovative creative uh, creative power of one of the genders. That's 50%. Now, let's talk about primatology. Primatology, of course, is the study of great apes, uh, primates. And here is Jane Goodall, the most uh, famous one. We all know and love her. Here is the second most famous primatologist, Diane Fossey, she was murdered, brutally murdered by poachers of the gorillas that uh, she was protecting. She has a book out called uh, Mist and the Gorillas. And um, there is a Hollywood movie that was made about her. And uh, Sigourney Weaver, a famous Hollywood actress, played her. So the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, you can go down to 20 and you'll get only two or three men. Primatologists are women. Now the working conditions of primatologists is nothing less than those of commandos. They have to spend weeks upon weeks in the jungle with leeches and god-awful conditions. It's not all cuddling with the chimpanzees like this. So to all those who think women would favor a clean environment, a nine to five job or flexible hours, what's happening with primatology? Well, it seems role models have made a difference. Jane Goodall, Diane Foster, and all these wonderful women have been amazing role models. And look, one of them, one of the most famous ones, got murdered. Didn't deter the others because her life mattered. Her life spoke to millions. She became an icon. She became someone uh, whose life became a Hollywood movie. It was important. This is what we want out of life. Our little girls want this out of life every bit as much as little boys do. So without further ado, here is the starting of uh, what I would like to talk about today. Instead of asking who should be an engineer, should they have a mind for math? Should they be logical? Should they like this or that? I think as university people, as educators of engineering, we should be the ones to support, to, to shoulder the responsibility and ask who the engineer should be. How should we raise our students? And instead of asking, what do engineers do? Well, there is so much more and different things that engineers now have to do in the 21st century that we need to ask, what must we do? There is a very fast evolution of our field. What we used to do in the last century, building bridges and electrifying buildings is not going to work anymore. And of course, we need to ask ourselves as an educator of engineering, I ask this to myself every single day, how must we teach? Not what must we teach? Our students will probably live to be a hundred, if not more, hopefully. We will not teach them everything they need to know the next 80 years, thinking the average age of our students is 20. We need to teach them what, not what to learn, but how to learn, how to go on learning, project-based learning, teamwork, and so on. So here is, instead of saying who should be an engineer, uh, let's look at how we shouldn't approach this. The whole right brain, left brain myth is disproven so many times scientifically, yet we keep on using this uh, analogy for some reason. Math brain. Math is the language of the universe. We all need to know math. We all need to learn math. If not one way, then another. But there's no such thing as math brain. 
Focusing versus multitasking. Everyone does this differently. No one is a pure multitasker. No one is a sharp focused person at all times. We just need to switch back and forth where it's called for. Physical strength, endurance, perseverance, physical attributes when it comes to engineering. All these years, I have not come across a time when my physical uh, strength, endurance, and perseverance was an advantage or a disadvantage in my profession. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Biorhythm and logic. Oh, because the moon's phases impacted something or other. Ah, oh. and of course, there are folks who prey on prejudices, amplifying prejudices, so people will feel validated or they'll feel they've learned something. This so-called doctor whose PhD is from a college that I've never heard of, has caused so much damage saying men are from Mars, women are from Venus. We're all from Earth and Mother Earth is in trouble, we all need to work on this planet. I'm sorry, John Gray. Seriously, what is professional identity? Here is the scientific definition. First off, obviously, it is the necessary knowledge that one should have. We understand that a plumber knows how to unclog uh, plumbing systems, they know how to keep the plumbing system of a house, a building, a city going. Second, the person themselves need to know that that's their professional identity. The plumber wakes up and says, I'm a plumber. I'll go do my job. I have what it takes to perform the duties, resp responsibilities expected of me. Unfortunately, for underrepresented minorities in a profession, the third component is also every bit as important. Others have to identify the individual with the identity. So we tell our girls, you can be anything you want. Of course, you can be a very good engineer. But if we don't educate everyone to accept, not judge, not bring in different set of expectations to one gender or another, the professional identity is unfortunately lacking. It's sorely lacking that social component. And of course, there has to be sense making. A mother can be an engineer, but we say she's both an engineer and a mother, can you believe this? Why not? An engineer and a poet, an engineer and a musician, an engineer and a photographer, an engineer and a father, mother, sister. Why not? We need to reconcile the different facets of the whole person and look at engineering as a professional identity. What must engineers do in this century? That levels the playing field. Whatever preconceived notions were keeping the professional identity of engineering gendered, we need to let go because what we need to do in this century, not too far from now, in this decade, is urgent. And we can't be missing out on half the population. Now, the United States National Academy of Engineering back in 2008 had come up with the grand challenges for engineering. Let's take a quick look at these multidisciplinary targets, advance and personalized learning, preventing nuclear terror, engineering better medicines, uh, reverse engineering the brain, providing access to clean water. Do these sound familiar? These were the precursors to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, announced some eight years later on January 1st, 2016. So I dare say the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are in great part, if not wholly, engineering problems. 
And we know that peace will be achieved on Earth if sustainable development goals are met. Engineers will achieve that. And engineering schools are extremely responsible with United Nations academic impact, with the new ranking systems coming up. We can't just be teaching classes and publishing papers. We need to do more. Now, in 2008, we said the United States National Academy of Engineering came up with the grand challenges. The same year, Global Engineering Dean's Council that I've been serving as the chair of, and I will for another two years, was formed with about 27 people from all around the world. And now we have more than 500 members in 50 countries of the world from every continent. This council was formed with a call for planetary action, declaring the planetary emergency that the whole world was facing back in 2008, recognizing the signs of the climate change, the energy crisis, the water, the poverty, the hunger, that the engineers needed to do something about the planetary emergency that humans had caused. So in 2008, with an inaugural statement, the GEDC, the Global Engineering Dean's Council was formed, calling to action all the academic engineering leaders of the world. This is the Paris Declaration. It's one page long and it was originally translated into 14 languages and now it's in every language on earth. I, of course, will not go through this, but it talks about raising the engineer of tomorrow who's supposed to be an adaptive engineering leader to raise adaptive engineering leaders. So there is adaptiveness and leadership added on top of engineering if we want to meet the sustainable development goals. So these are the original folks and their signatures. 10 years later, at our annual conference, 10th annual conference of the Global Engineering Dean's Council, we celebrated and launched peace engineering, meaning we're determined to do everything we can to use engineering tools and models in order to meet the sustainable development goals. And this has to be coordinated globally so that the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. At that meeting, I was announced the Global Engineering Dean's Council chair-elect. I'm the eighth chair of the Global Engineering Dean's Council. Here are some of the previous chairs. Out of eight chairs, four are men, four are women, interlead with our male colleagues because this is a very meritocratic election-based society. I'm very proud to serve as the chair of this society where diversity in engineering is one of our main goals. Now, engineering identities, this is a verbose biograph. I will not read through it, but I would like to bring out some of the main points it's verbose for purposes of making sure I don't forget any of the important ones. Now, engineering curricula or faculty at existing engineering schools and colleges do not always facilitate educational opportunities on the professional identity of engineering. Everyone thinks they have an understanding of it and they unfortunately hold on to it. Um, we, we need to have new ways of including the professional identity aspect in every educational program and make sure they're diverse, inclusive, and gender neutral. We need to help all students uh, form an inclusive definition of engineering. So anyone from underrepresented groups in engineering would easily see themselves in the profession, not simply by being pushed 
and supported saying you can of course be what you want even though you're in minority we also need to pull them with the acceptance with the encouragement of others so that the entire uh, facets of uh, professional identity are met the social aspect of identity is extremely important this is why everyone needs to be educated not just the underrepresented minorities so let's talk about women in technology we all know the leaky pipeline model well first i want to talk about the gender equality index paradox here i am in the american university of sharjah in the emirate of sharjah of united arab emirates uh, it's an exemplary country when it comes to the encouragement and support of women in technology. But here is this famous paradox of uh, women in STEM disciplines in universities along the x-axis. And we have the global gender gap index of those countries. Now, Here's Finland and Norway, extremely high in the gender equality index and low in uh, women studying STEM disciplines. Here we have Turkey, Tunisia, Algeria, United Arab Emirates is right here. These Middle Eastern countries where the gender equality index is low, there are more girls in STEM disciplines. What's happening? Well, because the professional identity of STEM disciplines in general, engineering in particular, has these unfortunate preconceived notions of being difficult, being masculine. Now, if gender equality index is low, that means masculine translates to respectable, more respectable. So now, those girls who trust themselves, have the confidence in themselves, go more and more into the STEM disciplines in those countries where the profession is gendered as masculine. We know that's a conflict in itself, it's a paradox. But then this is only a snapshot of women in engineering colleges and universities not necessarily at the work workplace in the workforce you see women in technology unfortunately have this leaky pipeline they have to go through so instead of constantly pushing more girls into this pipeline knowing that they'll drop out we need to close those holes in the pipeline and pull more women into the workforce, keep them in the workforce, make the best of their creative, innovative powers. By the way, for those who say, well, women are more uh, responsible for the home front and the kids, the reasons why women drop out of the workforce have nothing to do or little to do with family. It's mostly about being discriminated against, being outcast, being left alone, not being given the appropriate expectations and responsibilities. The family, it's shortened maternity leave, ranks very low down here. At my university, I just asked my colleagues, the heads of departments in my college today, for the percentage of female students in their departments. As I mentioned, in the Middle East here, we have extremely high percentages compared to the United States and Europe. But look at mechanical engineering, and then computer science and engineering, civil engineering. By the way, I looked at the master's programs and uh, our master's in construction management is in 20%. Our uh, master's in mechatronics is less than 20% again. So we have chemical engineering who's carrying the flag here. And uh, 
if we were to have a textile engineering department, I'm sure we would have more uh, girls there. What's happening? Even among engineering disciplines, we have those that are gendered. For some reason, civil engineering is more masculine or not fit for a girl. Electrical engineering is more fit for a boy. My, my field. I have no idea why that is. These are prejudices that we have to break. We can't just look at the whole and say, well, 36% is pretty respectable when you look at the world average. No, we have a 17% here that we have to work on. Until everything is just about 50%, we will not rest. Why is it so important? Well, we've been talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, there is a McKinsey report that said, if best country in each region were to be matched by its neighbors in terms of gender equality. So this is not about meeting the 50% goal or anything. Just match to the best in the region. Attainable goal, isn't it? Overnight, we would be pumping 12 trillion US dollars into the global economy. And if we were to achieve the full potential of women, that number would be 28 trillion. And of course, the projection was for 2025. The report was published in 2015. So we're exactly halfway there, almost past. Are we halfway there in anything other than half the decade has been spent without really making an inch of progress? It's extremely sad. This is money. This is resources. This is funds. We're stealing from the future by not doing what needs to be done. This money, this potential belongs to our children and grandchildren. Now, here's the vision that the uh, United States National Academy of Engineers had put out with those grand challenges. And since then, this vision statement has been embraced by the global engineering community as the vision of engineering for the 21st century. Continuation of life on the planet, not human life, life on the planet making our world more sustainable, secure, healthy, and joyful. Everything is interconnected. We better recognize that we cannot live without each other. Here is a photo of a coral reef, because it's a pretty photo. OK, no, because it symbolizes this vision. If you were to take part of it, Put it in a flower pot, bring it home because it's so pretty. It will die. It will not live. And you will have wounded the rest of it profoundly. It takes forever to heal, if at all. So how should engineering schools teach with all that motivation? Well, here is an example. Uh, fortunately, this wonderful woman that we lost in 2018 uh, Professor Susanna Eason was on faculty at Technical University of Munich in the engineering school. She was not an engineer. She was a sociologist and she specialized in engineering education. And she worked on inclusive teaching, learning environments. We need someone like her on every engineering faculty that would make a huge difference. We need to celebrate women in engineering. The lack of role models is not true. We simply do not celebrate women as much as men. I was giving a talk at one of the um, one of the electro home electronics giants uh, headquarters. They did not know the inventors of their own of their own product lines. This woman is Josephine Cochran, who invented the dishwasher. 
This was her drawing out of her patent. These are the gentlemen who invented other common appliances that we find around our homes. Here is a hall of fame, if you will, just a select few of women inventors. I'm a wireless communications person. Here is Heidi Lamar, who's responsible for the spread spectrum systems that we use in 4G and 5G. Here's Arjan Anoja. And all of these women have contributed with something that we're using in our everyday lives to the way we work and play. So I'm very proud that as Global Engineering Dean's Council, we came up with the hashtag I look like an engineer initiative. We would like to carry this forward as best we can. So with that, I think um, just about half an hour, 33 minutes into my talk, maybe I could open up uh, the floor for questions and here is a bouquet of thanks for listening to me, uh, symbolizing diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very educational and inspiring uh, talk. Uh, when I'm listening to you, I think about my life because I'm a mining engineer and my mother is a civil engineer. My both parents are civil engineers. And when I was child, I was going to her workplace and I, I always see that there are men only. And my mother is only one who is working, uh, who she is working there. And when I got into that, to the college, I see that many of my professors uh, tell the uh, class, guys, let's see that graph, guys. <laughs> I was there, but I'm uh, one or two girls in the class. So there was a diversity, even they don't want to do it, but they can, they are doing because I don't know. <laughs> uh, when I'm listening to you, I think about my life and thank you for uh, helping us to not uh, gender natural education. Uh, First of all, my best regards to your parents. Obviously they raised a lovely, wonderful daughter and um, of course, we want to see a lot more engineers in every field of engineering. And mining engineering is especially gendered, as you well know. Yeah. <laughs> Many of my uh, friends, female friends, are working in the area right now. So uh, we are trying to, uh, I don't know, not equal, but try to be equal in the working area right now in Turkey. But we will hope we will do it in every aspect of engineering. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. And uh, there is a question. It's not about your topic, but uh, let me ask because it's in the questions. Uh, there is uh, Malik Global Technology. How I get jobs at Turkey? He is an electrical engineer, but I'm not sure that you can answer that question. I'm sorry, what is the question? How I get jobs at Turkey, he says. He's an electrical engineer. How I get? Jobs at Turkey, he says. <laughs> How do I get jobs in Turkey? Oh, well, <laughs> I would go to LinkedIn and look at some of the uh, companies in Turkey. We have a lot of multinational companies also. I don't know where he is, but... Uh... And also we have a comment, and uh, I can't read her, her name, but great and inspiring. And she's my colleague here at uh, American University of Sharjah. Um, we have about 8% uh, women on my faculty, unfortunately, but uh, we're extremely excited about um, bringing in more colleagues, uh, more uh, role models for our 36% that, that female student body. Um, I'm the first and unfortunately still only female uh, Dean of Engineering, not only in the United Arab Emirates, but in the MENA region. Uh, it, it, I'm proud to be the first of anything, of course, as we are, but I'm not at all happy 
uh, for being the only one. And so with my female colleagues, such as Lovely Hand, uh, we're working very hard on uh, raising ourselves and our students. Uh, and Malik says, thank you <laughs> to you, <laughs> you will do it. Good and luck, also, Malik. I hope you make it. And also, I want to ask one more question to you. Uh, in To become serious, we are trying to, as women, trying not to be beautiful. If they think us a beautiful woman, then they don't think that our intelligence, the beauty comes first sometimes. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> um, because I always think uh, we should all be healthy mm -hmm. and healthy is beautiful because nature has um, programmed us that way. Uh, and I would advise all uh, of our students, male and female, to make sure they exercise, eat right, be the best they can be in terms of their physical health. And that looks good because Mother Nature programmed us that way. If uh, someone is healthy, uh, then they look good. And uh, I look at my students and they, look, they all look incredibly beautiful to me. I think it's the most, of course, I miss, I miss my students, all of our students so much to to go into a classroom and see like this huge bouquet of flowers is just amazing um and i think they're all beautiful so i really don't know how else to answer this thank you we very much care of ourselves <laughs> thank you very much uh you're missing your students right because you're in an uh, online education right now like yeah. the other <laughs> We are, but of course, with engineering education, we have the uh, extra uh, experiential education component that, say, a School of Business Administration student uh, wouldn't miss. So we're trying to make sure our students have some kind of access to the labs, especially for their design projects. Uh, they have to keep away from each other and us, but uh, we keep cleaning up the building and letting them in in a controlled manner if they need to do design projects. And then, of course, we migrated to a lot of this virtual lab software business, which uh, is a dicey area when it comes to engineering labs. I think labs is very important in the engineering education because we need to see what is happening in the lab in the real life. Uh, you cannot read it in the, I don't know, textbooks and you cannot understand what it's written in there. So uh, we are, I'm a research assistant at Middle East, East Technical University, but we are not opening the labs because our, many of the uh, students are in the different cities and they cannot come. We need to do it virtually and it is hard. Uh, I understand you that uh, you open the labs. It is very good for these students, I think. Of course, we need to have students access to labs. Also, there's the question of internships. Uh, our students need to do internships to graduate. And that's another component of the experiential learning. Uh, so we launched the virtual internship program globally. Uh, it leveled the playing ground a little bit to where we could have interns from India, from the States and so on. Uh, so that was good because to do an internship elsewhere in another country, typically the obtaining of the visa takes as long as the internship itself and so on. So now no visas, no expensive airfare, uh, no carbon footprint. Uh, so we have all these interns from all over the place, but it's not the same as having them in the lab face to face, of course. So <laughs> pros and cons, silver lining. Uh, these, are, these are the end of my questions. If you have any questions, you may write it in the comments part. And I can ask uh, Professor Tekinai right now. Uh, 
but no, <laughs> there is no uh, questions right now. And uh, what? Uh, I was just looking at the chat window. No questions, right? No, <laughs> not now. If they can, uh, if they have any questions, they will ask you. Uh, why? Uh, I don't know. From you. Sure. I'm obsessive compulsive with my email. So if you write to me at Aztec and I at a, a US .edu, I will get back to you. Oh, thank you very much for today coming here. Uh, it was very pleasure for us to be uh, glad uh, to be here. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Let me say. Thank you, Cardan. Lovely to meet you. All the very best. Thank you. This is the end of our session. Uh, we have another eight sessions and two e receptions. Don't forget it. Uh, just it is the end. See you in another session. Enjoy. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.